I'll wait till half past so that we know. Yeah, sure. Um, I've got my... They're starting to flood in now. Okay, it's half past. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to uh, the Tuesday webinar series. Uh, tonight, it's the uh, turn of HPB surgery. Um, my name is Christian Makutovic. I'm the director of the scientific program. I'm joined tonight uh, by one of my colleagues, uh, Siong Lau, who's a consultant HPB surgeon and director of finance at ASGBI. Um, and uh, we've got a great selection of talks uh, this evening. Um, we're going to start off uh, with uh, Shaili Patel uh, from Adam Brooks, who's going to talk to us uh, about preventing uh, liver failure post hepatectomy. Over to you, Shaili. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Shaili. I'm a general surgical trainee at Yorkshire. Uh, on behalf of the team at Adam Brooks, uh, I would like to present a systematic review on Technetium 99 Mebrofenin HPS study uh, versus volumetry in the prediction and prevention of post hepatectomy liver failure and liver failure related mortality. Next slide, please. Uh, liver failure is a known complication of major liver resections. And to ensure that it doesn't happen, uh, it's important to know the uh, future remnant liver uh, prior to any procedure or surgery. Traditionally, the assessment was done preoperatively by measuring volumetry. Um, however, volumetry does not directly correlate with the liver function, especially in the context of underlying chronic liver disease, or uh, especially when patients have had uh, chemotherapy prior to surgery. Uh, therefore, it, it may inaccurately predict the functional reserve of the liver. HPS uh, is a possible solution to this problem as it gives us a quantitative as well as a qualitative estimation of the uh, liver function. The aim of this review was to compare HPS to volumetry in predicting liver failure and liver failure related mortality. The uh, review was carried out following PRISMA guidelines uh, using PubMed, Medline, and Embase. The included literature underwent a qualitative analysis and synthesis. Next slide, please. Um, of the 851 papers, uh, there were six relevant papers, uh, which included four single cohorts and two comparative cohorts. The four single cohorts all showed that the HPS cutoff values outperformed volumetric cutoff values for prediction of uh, liver failure. Um, multivariate analysis on those four papers also showed that HPS cutoff values were independent predictors of liver failure, whereas volumetric, anal whereas volumetric cutoff values were not. Of the two comparative cohorts, uh, it was found that patients who had uh, who were assessed with HPS uh, had 11 to 13.6% less risk of liver failure and 12.5 to 19.5 less risk of liver failure related mortality. Next slide, please. Um, therefore, it may be concluded that HPS may be an investigation of choice um, to guide eligibility for um, surgical resection also uh, for consequence selection of preoperative PVE or other hypertrophic st uh, strategies. Um, the safe HBS cutoff values um, as determined from the comparative study uh, were of 2.7% per minute per meter square for mixed disease entities. So that could be used uh, uh, as a future reference. However, the limitations of this review uh, were that the uh, studies included had very small sample size. Uh, there were no RCTs included in this analysis. 
uh, and also the included comparative cohort studies, varied in population, measurement methodologies, and PV cutoff values, making ex extrapolation uh, less generalizable. Um, next slide, please. Um, and that's it. Thank you. Any questions, please? Thank you very much, Shaili. Um, I, I think that uh, shows promise on, uh, on how to accurately measure uh, the functional liver remnant. Have you any ideas or thoughts on why it's not, HBS is not so widely used around the country? Is it expensive? Uh, is it difficult to do? Why aren't we using it? Um, yes, one of the reasons is, it is because it is expensive and the other is the data is limited. Um, however, uh, because of these promising results, lots and lots of uh, institutes, especially in Europe, they've started using HBS as a standard prior to uh, surgery or any intervention such as PV or ALPS. Okay, very good. Let um, me see if there's any other further questions. Um, no. Okay, we'll go on to the next speaker. Thank you very much. Over to you, Siong. Great. I think we have the next speaker from Glasgow. Um, I think Priscilla Brennan is going to give us a talk on prognostic factors affecting survival following resection of distal glandular carcinoma. The floor is yours, Priscilla. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Priscilla. Uh, I've just finished up a year of general surgery at the Glasgow Royal um, and was involved in this study looking at prognostic factors affecting survival um, of patients post resection of distal glandular carcinoma. Um, Cholangiocarcinomas are quite a highly heterogeneous disease group and they historically and currently have quite a poor prognosis. Um, there has been an increasing shift in managing this disease within its subtypes, being intrahepatic, perihilar and distal disease, um, as they're becoming increasingly more and more their own distinct disease entities. Um, the aim of this study was to specifically focus on distal cholangiocarcinoma um, and to assess the survival outcomes and prognostic factors um, associated with those after resections. Um, so this study involved 83 patients from a single centre prospectively maintained database in Glasgow. Um, all the patients underwent surgical resection um, over a span of about 25 years. Um, most patients uh, underwent the classic Whipple's resection and the remainder extrahepatic bile duct resections. Um, the results showed that the median survival was about 19 months and the overall survival at one, three and five years as shown on the screen with the five year survival of 23.2%. Next slide, please. Um, the plots shown were factors that were found to be significant um, in relation to the prognosis and survival outcomes after surgery. Um, the most significant being uh, perineural invasion and lymphatic invasion. Um, associated with a much poorer uh, outcome. Um, chemotherapy, however, on the other hand, was not seen to have a significant impact on the survival of these patients. Um, next slide, please. So in conclusion, um, distal cholangiocarcinoma itself remains um, a highly uh, poorly prognosis disease um, with very high recurrent rates um, and the median survival fits with um, other studies that have looked at biliary tract cancers. Um, tumor resection is currently the only curative management of distal cholangiocarcinoma. Um, however, studies are ongoing to look at uh, chemotherapy treatments, um, but there's a lot more to be learned and there's a lot more research to be done um, for better therapeutic options. Thank you, any questions? Okay, um, thank you, Priscilla. Um, this is a, it's quite an interesting study. Um, um, the one thing that strikes me is that um, you've obviously found that adjuvant chemotherapy um, has not improved the overall survival. Uh, has there been a change um, can you describe to me what sort of regimens of chemotherapy that has evolved in the 25 years? Say that again, sorry? Can you describe to me the, the practice of adjuvant chemotherapy within your unit? Obviously, this is a very long cohort in terms of 25 years of work. Uh, I presume that chemotherapy 
evolved during that period of time? Sure, yeah. And how do you reconcile this with what we know right now uh, from randomized controlled trials on, for instance, Bill Cap trials that has been done on cholangiocarcinomas? And obviously that has shown some benefit from adjuvant chemotherapy. How do you reconcile your data with that? Um, yeah, great question. Um, I don't know the specifics in terms of the actual chemotherapies used, but I do know that they've developed over um, very recent years. So a lot of the cohort that we looked at, um, the majority um, got gem cytopene or cap cytopene kind of in line with what was found at BillCap. Um, I think the majority of the randomized con or the big con clinical trials have looked at um, the biliary tract cancers and all uh, and not specifically at um, the different subtypes. Um, so, you know, there's a lot more um, to go in terms of looking at the specific subtypes um, in terms of being effective. Okay, good. Um, just one last question. To, uh, in terms of the chemotherapy, some of this, that do you think that uh, the ones who had completed chemotherapy um, had impact or are they all the patients, you know, some patients would have had ripples presumably and then had some chemotherapy but don't complete the full cost. Do you have an idea about uh, the chemotherapy that you guys have had, the patients have had, have they all completed chemotherapy or was there a lot of patients having undergone maybe one or two months of chemotherapy and then um, do not complete the full cost? Um, most of our patients who completed, uh, uh, who started chemotherapy completed the courses. Okay, good. All right. Uh, I think, um, Christian, over to you for the next speaker. Thanks, Yong. So um, the next uh, speaker is Mustafa Majid uh, from uh, Oxford, one of my good friend's uh, unit. Giles uh, obviously has a huge interest in uh, uh, cholecystectomy. Over to you, Mustafa. Hi there, thank you. Um, so my name is Mustafa Majid and I'm a fifth year medical student at Oxford University. And today I present to you findings from a study into strategies of preventing gram-negative bloodstream infections of HPV origin. Next slide, please. So uh, gram-negative bloodstream infections or a GNBSI are a major threat to public health uh, they contributed to 5,500 patient deaths in England in 2015. Uh, their incidence is rising and they are one of the three largest drivers of antimicrobial resistance in the UK. Preventing these infections is therefore a crucial priority for the health service, with the government setting targets to lower the incidence of these infections over the coming years. The HPB cohort is the second largest cohort of patients with GNBSI nationally, after the urinary system. Uh, despite the size of the HPB cohort, uh, few strategies have been explored to reduce the incidence of HPB-related GNBSI. To address this gap, we conducted a retrospective analysis of 388 cases of HPB GNBSI within our trust over a four-year period to determine how many cases were preventable. Uh, we accessed patient records for each case documenting the source of the infection any previous evidence of HPV disease prior to the infection and whether the patient had received any um, surgical or non-surgical management for that prior HPV disease. Uh, next slide, please. So of the 388 cases, 282 were caused by gallstone disease. Uh, 165 of these cases occurred at the first presentation of gallstone disease. Um, for these cases, no strategy was likely to have prevented the bloodstream infection because the window to deliver a prophylactic intervention had been lost by the time they were admitted with bacteremia. 117 cases occurred after a previous documented presentation of gallstone disease. Uh, in these 117, gallstone disease had recurred despite prior management and had led to a GNBSI. For these cases, there was a window for preventing the GNBSI. 93 of the 117 had previously received non-surgical management for their prior gallstone disease, and that consisted either analgesia or antibiotics. Uh, while 24 of the 117 had received a prior cholecystectomy, 
but still went on to develop gallstone related GMBSI. Next slide, please. So for the 93 cases that had received non-surgical management, who represent 24% uh, of the total cases, we contend that they were potentially preventable if a laparoscopic cholecystectomy had been performed at their first presentation with symptomatic gallstone disease. And based on the findings of this project, we have produced a list of recommendations for preventing HPB GNBSI. Firstly, gallstone disease is a priority target as it accounted for 73% of the cases. Secondly, um, a lap coli should be offered to patients at their index presentation of symptomatic gallstone disease as per the guidelines. And thirdly, um, early lap coli should be offered when indicated. If it's not indicated, then a timely elective lap coli should be performed. Uh, the take home message is doing more cholecystectomies and earlier cholecystectomies should have a sizable impact on lowering the rates of HPB gram negative sepsis. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mustafa. Great, uh, great results, and obviously has a potentially huge impact on the socio-economic uh, uh, um, uh, economics of, of healthcare. Do you know any any idea on how much you would save if uh, those cholecystectomies were performed in those ninety-three cases where it should have been done on index admission? Uh, I I don't actually know that, unfortunately. I don't, don't have worry. The financial I, data. A hard question if you hadn't done that. Of the cases that recurred, the, the patients that had a cholecystectomy and yet they came in with more um, yes, yeah. RAM negative uh, sepsis, what was the cause of that? Did they have so, stones? Yeah, so 18, 18 of those 24 had retained CBD stones and the other had assorted various pathologies like um, bile leak, um, liver abscesses, they were all very different, but the majority were retained stones. Okay. Can you think of any way that you could try and reduce the number of retained stones? in? Your yeah. So, so for these patients, um, we've discussed that uh, intraoperative biliary tract imaging, things like cholangiography and intraoperative ultrasound to look for those stones would be helpful. But of course, that wouldn't be feasible to do it um, routinely for every single patient. So we would recommend that in patients with indications or, or risk factors for CBD stones like jaundice and um, cholestatic uh, LFTs and dilated CBD on ultrasound, those patients should be considered for those intraoperative imaging procedures. Okay, very good. Thank you very much. Over Thank to you, Xiong. Uh, great. Um, I think our next speaker is from Hull. Um, Mr. Elshai is going to give us his talk on promoting role of redefining the resection Martin status in pancreatic cancer. Over to yeah. you. Mr. Hi, I'm Ahmed, hi, I'm Ahmed Elshai. I just need to thank the team in Hull who did the, this project with me, Tamir Said, and Mr. Dometro Daskopta. So speaking about the promoting role of redefining the resection margin in pancreatic cancer. So next slide, please. So recent data speak about uh, R1 resection, which is less than one millimeter. The survival is quite worse uh, compared to the R0 with more recurrence. However, there is no much study speak about if there is a different types for R1 margins and how that will affect the survival. So in this study, we have this data, which is collected prospectively for all of the patients has a pancreatic me from 2008 to 2013. And we have a follow-up, which is median follow-up was about six years. So all of the tumor pathology has been encountered and the R status was evaluated. And then for R1 resections, we further classified them to anatomical margins and surgical margins. And the difference mainly in the anatomical margins, the margins that we cannot further resect like anterior border, posterior, or circumferential. However, surgical margins mean if there is any margins involved in the SMV, portal vein or pile duct or pancreatic neck because all of these margins can be resected surgically. Next slide, please. So we have 134 patients with a median age 66 and most of them is males. The most common pathology in our study is pancreatic adenocarcinoma with 60%. With neck is still ambulatory carcinoma and carcinoma. And for the margins we have R0 resection 46% and R1 resection in a 54%, so it's nearly equal uh, in the numbers between both of them, not much difference between the numbers. 
And then when we look for the survival, first we look for the pathology, and we found that the ampullary carcinoma had a better, has a best survival with about 5.8 years, and with a significant B value compared to the rest of the pathologic, pathologies, which is pancreatic or adenocarcinoma or cholangiocarcinoma. And then when you compare R0 to R1, we found that R0 has a best, better survival with a significant B value. Next slide, please. And then when we look in details about the R1 margins, and we found the patients, we have some anterior and some posterior, some circumferential, which under uh, the anatomical margins. And for the surgical margins, all of the margins involved with just SMV or portal vein. And then when we make a comparison between this R1 anatomical and surgical, we found there is a significant p-value for worse prognosis for these people, worse survival for those who have positive surgical margins. And then we did a multivariant analysis for all of the factors affecting survival. We found that presence of lymph nodes and presence of a resection have a significant survival, uh, shorter survival. However, for R1, if we take it as a factor in, a, in, in the analysis, we found it's not significant on the univariate analysis. Next, please. So overall conclusion is that R1 resection is having less survival as most recent studies. However, when we look further about the R1 resections, we found that we, if, when we classified them to the pathological type and to the site of the R1 resection, it affects the survival. However, we still need more studies with more numbers to compare about the different sides of R1 to ensure the conclusion we have. Thanks, you. Any questions? If I understand correctly, um, sorry, I was muted earlier. Um, yeah, well done. Um, if I understand correctly, based on your data, um, patients who have SMV and portal vein margin being R1 uh, has one of the poorest survival. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So portal vein or SMV, which we called as a surgical margin, has a worse survival compared to the anatomical margins with a significant B value. Sure. And uh, would that then imply that uh, this patient should have a portal vein resection? Yeah, is that what we think for that we should have a portal vein resection for them because the R1 for them is quite worse compared to the other margins. Okay. And have you then compared within your data the patients who have had portal vein resection and no portal vein resection? Is there a survival difference? No. Sorry again, you mean about the patients had a portal vein resection and not and don't have, right. no, no, we, 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 no we, we didn't have any comparison between that. However, we looked for all patients in general who had a portal vein resection, like for all patients, and we found it significantly affects the survival wars. So that means once the portal vein or SMV is involved, it, it affects the survival wars. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, the other thing is that obviously, uh, although you managed to classify the margins into three uh, four different types uh, yes. from the surgical type. Um, often, uh, from you know, as you know, um, it's not a single margin that's involved. Uh, patients could have, uh, you know, anterior posterior. It could have yeah. SMV portal vein uh, because that's just a reflection of a, bu a bigger tumor and therefore yeah. worse biology. Yeah, so, so circumferential, we mean with circumferential if more than one margin. So if like anterior and posterior, we, may, we put it under circumferential. So essentially, are you saying then that um, the circumferential measured margins are when you have, uh, let's say, two sites involved? Exactly, yeah. Is, is that, um, so how do you explain then that if you have two margins involved, but if you have portal vein involvement, that's actually far worse. No, so, so, so again, so circumferential is mean if it's anterior and posterior involved, okay? Yeah. And yeah. the numbers we have in circumferential is quite less compared to the others. So, okay. so yeah, so it's a very number of, who have a circumferential as a number of patients are very less compared to the others. Okay. So, so, so it's a, yeah, so the survival we have for circumferential with this small number 
was quite still better than the patients who have their SMV. The other okay. thing is you mentioned about we have four uh, descriptions for the surgical site, like pancreatic neck and bile duct. The, the only thing we think we don't have much numbers for the pancreatic neck and bile duct because we do frozen section in, in high frequency. So okay. if we have any, any frozen uh, so positive uh, for pancreatic neck or bile duct, we continue the section intraoperatively. Okay, so we've got a question from the floor. Um, is there any difference um, in terms of the lymph node status um, in the groups of patients? Does lymph nodes affect the outcome? Yeah, so, so lymph nodes, we, put it, we found it it's significant affects the survival as we looked here for the multivariant analysis. So all of patients has a node N1 at least. We have a worse prognosis compared to the other. So it was quite significant factor when we did a multivariate var var analysis. So is this a yes or no lymph nodes or is it? Yes, uh, yeah, yes, yeah. So yes, yes, yes or no, without looking for the numbers. Okay, yeah. so that's, that's because very few patients would have nodal, not negative disease, even though I'm in. Exactly, uh, exactly. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah, thank you. Over to you, Christian. Okay, uh, so we've got uh, Dr. Pfeiffer, there's no first name here that I can see, uh, from Arun Saha's group uh, in Huddersfield. Um, are we, uh, Helen, um, yeah, sure. are we uh, missing a trick in uh, opportunities in training in Lapacoli? Over to you. Hi everyone, my name's uh, Helen, uh, that's what H stands for here. <laughs> um, yes, I'm here to present this short study, uh, training laparoscopic cholecystectomy, um, several missed opportunities on behalf of um, other colleagues at my trust. Um, so next slide, please. So of course, uh, laparoscopic cholecystectomy is um, a core operation for surgical trainees. Um, all, all general surgery trainees need to have completed, I uh, believe, 30 by CCT and for special interest of the GI trainees, that's 110. Um, obviously, we have well-established uh, assessment tools, um, online portfolios, um, breaking the operation down. Um, and of course, it's a very common operation for the acute take and of course, um, electively as well. However, we've always got this balance between um, training and service provision. Um, uh, we found that uh, as operations are performed acutely, that can uh, cause problems uh, for training. And of course, um, as there becomes more demand on the service, there's uh, increased issues for the trainees. Um, next slide, please. Um, so our aims is to assess uh, the variability in training for a laparoscopic test cystectomies for trainees um, and then also to identify any factors that are associated with successful completion of the procedure by a trainee. Um, we looked at um, all lap coles completed over a 24 month period retrospectively um, from January 2018 to December 2019. Of course we collected uh, demographics for these including who's completed the procedure and any um, post-op complications etc. Um, in total, uh, there was 1,023 uh, procedures performed in this study, 57% uh, of them were uh, acutely. Reassuringly, uh, there was a 0% mortality and a 0% bile duct injury in the study. Um, interestingly, in 2018, 41% of the procedures were completed by um, a registrar, um, which differs with 2019 where only 20% were completed. We had three operations completed by a CT in our study. Um, factors that we found uh, were associated uh, with the operation being completed by a registrar are the level of the uh, trainee, so ST6 to ST8, um, the trainer themselves being um, an upper GI specialist, um, the trainee being having performed at least 40 cases prior um, and also the trainee at the time being allocated to an upper GI firm. Um, next slide, please. Um, so uh, limitations, of course, it's a retrospective study, um, some issues with how data is collected at the time. Um, no trainee is the same. We have trainees at the trust from SD3 to SD7 or 8. Um, they'll obviously have their subspeciality interests and the needs of a, a junior trainee and how many they might complete by the end of the year will of course be different to somebody that's higher. Um, there were differences in the um, 
2018 patients, 2019 patients, um, a greater proportion in 2019 were performed acutely, um, which has issues in terms of, for example, although you could have an upper GI on call at our trust, the, the trainee at the time could be a colorectal trainee, so their um, skills might be different and their needs might be different. Um, and we also noticed in 2019, there was an increased demand on the service in terms of waiting times for elective procedures. And therefore, at the time of the, the elective list, there might be uh, pressures on the surgeons to complete the operations. Um, another uh, limitation is um, we didn't really collect uh, any data on how difficult the procedure was and whether that affected who had completed it. Um, and of course, this study is the way the data is collected is quite black and white and, you know, uh, a lap coli can be broken down into stages and steps. And of course, as I mentioned before, the needs of a junior trainee to those more senior are different. Um, and therefore, this study doesn't really capture uh, those grey areas in terms of how much was completed by a trainee. And of course, uh, depending on who's written the operation note, uh, there's some ambiguity as to who uh, completed it, depending on how, whether they've written themselves as first or second surgeon. Um, so to conclude, um, it's potentially disappointing findings, especially with that only 20% of procedures being com uh, completed by a registrar. And it uh, shows, I guess, positively that there's a lot of scope for training that we could um, improve on. Um, obviously, if we broke the operation down and did some more modular training, um, trainees need to be aware of what they can and can't do and make sure they're building on that each time. Um, having, potentially having lists of just having uh, lap coles, and then that gives the trainee and the trainer the whole day to sort of develop the skills and still complete parts of operations. Um, and then that means the operation is still completed by the end of the day with demands on the services. And of course, increasing um, access to theatre. Obviously now um, we're going through uh, the COVID and all the difficulties that that have. Um, but positively, um, our trust is um, making sure that we're trying to facilitate learning. Uh, most of our lap elective lap coles are now being performed actually outside of the trust. And we're working with um, the college and things to try and facilitate uh, training um, in the private sector, which is obviously um, difficult. Thank you, any questions? Thank you very much, Helen. Uh, I'd like to start myself. That We do have some uh, questions from the floor. Um, you've mentioned modular training. Now, it's something that uh, in pancreatic surgery we've used for quite a while because there are so many distinct steps with Whipples. In terms of a laparoscopic cholecystectomy, how would a uh, modular training for that uh, be uh, taken up by trainees um, what's the interest in doing that for uh, laparoscopic cholecystectomy and where would you where would you split the operation so that um, one trainee might do one part and one might do another? Uh, I guess, uh, thank you for the question. Um, I guess firstly just basically depending on the type of trainee obviously for someone like me it'd be starting with pneumoperitoneum and putting ports in um, and then obviously um, finding your callos and your safe triangle and then slowly starting to dissect. And then you've got obviously um, you're clipping, you're looking for your ducts and uh, clipping them and et cetera, this kind of thing. So I guess that would be how we could, how it could be broken down, et cetera. So that leads on to uh, the question from the floor is, uh, do you think that the solution would be dedicated SPR training lists? And you've alluded to the fact that that's not really very possible in the private sector at the moment, although I'm still um, trying to do some training in, in my private lists, uh, NHS private lists. Mm -hmm. um, do, do you think that's the solution uh, for the future, given our COVID situation? Yeah. I, do you I, have I, any better solutions? Um, I guess, yeah, I mean, I think, I think to be honest, that probably would would be a great solution because uh, I guess you're agreeing at the time at the beginning of the list what what the needs of both people are and having it dedicated uh, would sort of um, not forget that there is an opportunity for training which can often get missed if we don't sort of say that from the start so I guess it's uh, yeah okay um, 
hold on. We do we do have uh, one final question. Uh, do you feel current logbooks cover the modular training? Um, if uh, as my at my level of training, unfortunately, I don't um, I don't uh, have a huge huge knowledge knowledge of this. I I'll, I have to ad admit. So apologies, I can't. Uh, answer that right. question. I don't, think, I don't think it does uh, actually take into account modular training. It okay. takes into account uh, final numbers of cholecystectomies done. Uh, so it is a very relevant question. Thank you very much, Helen. That was really interesting. Over to you, Siong. Okay, thank you. Um, our next speaker is um, from Monklands in, in Scotland. Um, 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 the causes of conversion in laparoscopic cholecystectomy lessons learned and strategies to reduce this. Hisham. Uh, Hisham, I think you're, are you mute? Can you um, unmute? I don't think we can hear you, Hisham. Can you hear us, Hisham? I can hear you. Okay. Yeah, we, we can hear you now. Can you hear me now? Okay. Yeah. Perhaps you could go closer to your mic. Um, okay. Go ahead. Yeah, my name is Hisham, specialty doctor and an anesthetic tire. Yeah. Uh, about the post post conversion, like a post post test, and how to do Next slide, please. So uh, the literature reports a variable uh, uh, rate of conversion uh, across different uh, surgeons and hospitals, which is very wide, ranging from 1 to 15 percent, various factors reported contributing to this. Uh, we aim in our study here to show how subspecialization and high speed volume can reduce conversion rates safely and the strategy to use to reduce this. So we had a large series of 5,738 laparoscopic cholecystectomies performed over 28 years by a single surgeon or his trainee, including 1,218 laparoscopic bulk explorations. And uh, in our series, only 28 patients underwent conversion. That's a 0.49% conversion rate, which is much lower than the uh, rates reported in the literature. Um, the conversion rates for patients that only had laparoscopic cholecystectomy was only 0.27%. The 0.49 includes those that had a lot of bulk exploration as well. The most common reason for conversion uh, in our series was dense adhesions, and that's 32%, and followed by impacted CBD stones, and 25%. And the conversion rate in those that, that had a lot of bulk exploration was 1.2%, uh, made up of 2.9% in those that had a transductal exploration, and only 0.34%. 34% in those that had a transmitted exploration. Next, please. Next slide, please. Uh, the only significant predictors of conversion we found in our study was emergency admission, uh, presenting with jaundice, a history of previous epicolecystitis, and a dilated bile duct and ultrasound. 173 patients uh, underwent fundus first dissection and six had a subtotal for dissectomy which has potentially reduced our conversion rate from 3.5% to 0.49% if these maneuvers weren't uh, undertaken. Uh, stone fragmentation for impacted bulldog stone using biopsy forceps, ultrasound, large therapy, and laser elasticity facilitated laparoscopic uh, completion and clearance in 118 cases with impacted CBD stones, which again would have potentially ended up with a conversion. And in all these impacted CBD stones, a chloridoscopy was uh, used. Uh, four patients were referred to a uh, liver surgery unit for bare reconstruction immediately after uh, the laparoscopic cholecystectomy. Two patients due to bile duct injuries and two with Marie C, type 3 and 4 for uh, bilary reconstruction. Next slide, please. So this graph shows how our uh, conversion rate varied uh, across time. So in the earlier part of this series, uh, with the lower case volume, uh, the conversion rate was uh, higher. And then as you see, as the case volume uh, went up and growing experience, uh, the conversions became quite rare. So one case over in the past four years, and then two in the past 12 years. 
and this is uh, corresponding to the higher case volume and volume distribution. So our take home message is uh, open conversion should not be regarded as a complication or a failure. However, uh, it is occasionally the specific option for the patient, but uh, conversion still carries a high morbidity rate and it is good practice to consult a more experienced surgeon or specialized biliary surgeon if available before reserving the conversion because there's a good chance they might have a solution to avoid uh, the conversion. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank, thank you. Um, thanks, Isham. So, um, in your data, um, you've shown quite a large numbers of uh, laparoscopic bowel duct exploration. Um, in your series, um, in patients where potentially preoperatively you suspect or there's a high risk of uh, stones, or in fact, stones proven on MRCP, for instance, do you do uh, a lap? Uh, common bowel duct exploration by default, or would you clear it preoperatively with ERCP? So we don't actually rely on MRCP, and we perform routine uh, intraoperative angiography for all patients. And if found intraoperatively to have bowel duct stones, we clear them. But we do not routinely perform MRCP, even if they've got suspected bowel duct stones. We just do an intraoperative angiogram for everyone, and then deal with it as required. Okay, so so am I right in saying that within your service, you you don't really do very much ERCP at all? No, no. Okay, is that because there's no provision, or is that? Well, well not not in Monkland Hospital. In the in the trust there is, uh, but in Monkland Hospital we don't have ERCP. If someone does need an ERCP, they get referred to another oh. hospital in the trust to get that done. Right. Um, that's a that's a very large series there. Um, what is the Given the numbers of uh, lab bowel duct exploration that you do, um, have you got a longer term follow up data on these patients? Um, do they get strictures, for instance? No, no, we've got the figures actually follow up. I don't have the figures on top of my head, but uh, the, the results are quite good and there aren't any uh, strictures or recurrent ones. They're, they're quite rare. Okay, so we've got a question from the floor. Um, um, do you routinely concern lab coli patients then for bowel duct exploration? Because obviously, majority of these patients, based on what you've done, is uh, you would essentially find bowel duct stones at the time of the operations, and then you go ahead and explore the bowel duct within the same operation. So is that part of the sort of initial consent process with the patients? Yes. We consent all patients that if we will do, we'll do an echolangiogram and if we find stones, we'll go ahead and explore them. Yeah. Okay. All right, thank you. I think that's that's great. Thank you. Uh, over to you, um, Christian. Uh, thanks a lot, Siong. Uh, the next patient is uh, from uh, Cambridge. Boris Janssen uh, is going to talk to us about the different uh, biliary anatomical variants. That's a subject very uh, close to my heart. Uh, I always harp on about knowing the anatomical variants. Uh, Boris, over to you. Thank you very much for your introduction, Christian. Um, so I'll be telling you today about our project in which we did a meta-analysis of the prevalences of, uh, well, that's biliary anatomical variants, based on which we developed a new comprehensive prevalence-based uh, classification system. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so in short, when you're doing uh, extensive liver surgery, hepatic resections, uh, unawareness of anatomical variants may lead to severe complications with uh, adverse outcomes for patients. Um, but unfortunately, earlier research is quite inconclusive about the prevalences uh, of said uh, variants, making it difficult to actually in implement uh, this knowledge. So to address this issue, we performed a systematic review where we included all literature which actually addressed uh, the issue of prevalence of intrahepatic biliary and intubical variants. Um, and from this literature, we extracted uh, all the prevalence distributions but as they use different classification systems, such as the Huang, uh, Choi, Okuba, or Kuno, we uh, combined them to a single system focused on five variants, uh, including one category which allows for other variants. And we then did a separate meta-analysis for each variant using a multinomial logistic mixed effect model. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so we found a total of 35 studies which are relevant for this question. Uh, and in these studies, we found 11,700 patients. 
so here you can see our um, anatomical classification and the prevalences of each subtype, uh, where tau 1 is the most common anatomical variant, which is found in 66%. Then type uh, 2, which consists of type 2A and 2B, wherein uh, one of the right sectoral ducts uh, drains into the left common duct or the left duct, um, either it being right posterior or right anterior. And this percent is found in 14.1% of the patients. Then type 3, which is the trifurcation, uh, which is found in 11.7% of the population. Type 4, where the right posterior duct drains into the common hepatic duct in 6.5%. And type 5 for the uh, right posterior duct drains into the cystic duct, which is found in 0.5% of the population. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so there are several points to discuss uh, from this project. Um, in short, we've provided a novel prevalence-based classification system, which is both based on the most extensive meta-analysis to date um, and the merits of the earlier systems with a focus on surgical relevance. Um, so type 1 is usually not prone to be uh, any issue during surgery. Um, type 2 is relevant during left hepatectomies and uh, living donor liver transplants. Type 3 is also relevant during uh, living donor liver transplants. And type 4 and 5 are relevant during cholecystectomies. And there are several areas of attention regarding this paper uh, which you need to be aware of. And I think that uh, there are quite extensive uh, differences to be found between populations. Uh, fortunately, we couldn't really cover it in uh, this short presentation, but these will follow. Um, they need to be aware uh, of the 0.5% of variants which are not covered by this classification system. So there are, are also quite a lot of uh, subtypes uh, that can also be clinically relevant. And finally, um, there's a difference between the 2A and the 2B, um, and we're not really aware of the prevalences of these subtypes and also the literature which we actually used doesn't really report on these differences. So uh, that's it, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Boris. That was a really nice uh, presentation and uh, has a lot of uh, surgical applicability. Um, the, I'll just start with uh, my question and then we do have a, uh, one from the floor straight away. Um, in England uh, or in the UK, we're not really taught uh, about the uh, variations, unless you're a HPB surgeon. Um, given the, the difference uh, in um, the posterior sectoral duct going into the common hepatic duct for uh, cholecystectomy, um, obviously this is uh, of relevance to all surgical specialties. What, where do you want to go next with this project and how, how do you think you should best disseminate your findings? Uh, excellent question. Um, obviously, this is of more relevance to other surgeons as well. Um, so, well, I think first of all, publishing would be a, a good thing to do to spread the word. Um, but yeah, furthermore, I think it, it may make sense that every surgeon who's actually working on, on the biliary tract should really be aware in their curriculum of these subtypes uh, and the actual consequences of these. So, yeah, I should, yeah, I should include it in the teaching curriculum and. Uh, Absolutely. And how are you going to address the, the, the 0.5 percent of other variants? Obviously, these are the variants that we as HPB surgeons are really uh, careful over because they're the ones that can trip you up when you're doing a hepatectomy or a living donor uh, transplantations. How are you going to how are you going to try and address these 0.5 percent other variants? Are you talking about when you're doing surgery? Then the really, the, the, you've, you've addressed the common ones, the ones yeah. that are really prevalent in your meta-analysis. What about the rare ones that HPB surgeons really need to know about? I'm actually not aware about all those separate okay. variants uh, no because there are, there, there are a lot of them I found when doing, when doing this <laughs> research. Uh, so for, for this project, we were really trying to focus on, uh, on the main clinical relevancy um, uh, That's great. Yeah, I look forward to the paper. I think it's something that um, all trainees should read. Um, the next one is an easier question for you. Um, what is your view on the role of uh, ICG, indocinin green, on intra or for intraoperative bile duct visualization? So that's the green uh, ICG test that we can sometimes use for intraoperative uh, visualization of the bile duct. Have you any experience or what's your view of that? I, I do not have any experience, no experience. at all. So, 
It's okay. Siong, rescue him. I will uh, put you back on. <laughs> Thanks a lot, <laughs> Boris. Thank you. Right, thank you. So we have um, the next um, paper from Birmingham. Um, uh, Mr. Jensen um, will be giving his talk on intensive management of borderline arterial and locally advanced pancreatic cancer results in surgical outcomes comparable to resectable stage of disease. Over to you, Jensen. Uh, Jensen. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Hans uh, Lembach. I'm the clinical fellow in HPV and transplant surgery. Thank you for the opportunity of presenting this paper. Next, please. So as you all know, multimodal treatment is the standard of care for uh, borderline and locally advanced uh, pancreatic cancer. But the logistics of uh, detection, evaluation, and treatment of these patients are challenging and can impact results. So our unit has an active management of this uh, group of patients. The aim of this uh, presentation is uh, reviewing the surgical outcomes of uh, patients with locally advanced and borderline arterial uh, pancreatic cancer. This is a retrospective review of patients treated between 2017 and 2019. Uh, locally advanced and borderline uh, arterial biopsy proven PDAX. Uh, we reviewed patient data, neoadjuvant chemo, uh, restaging, and surgical results. Next, please. So basically, 637 patients were uh, seen in our MDT with a suspected PDAC. 200 of them had a suspected borderline arterial or locally advanced disease. These patients were sent to EUS uh, guided biopsy and oncology evaluation. And of them, uh, 91 patients uh, unfortunately would not fit or rejected uh, neoadjuvant therapy. So 48% of the total group, 99, actually started neoadjuvant chemo. Uh, 78% uh, received fulfirinox. 74% uh, uh, of them completed at least three months. And after three months, 19 patients were uh, deemed resectable and sent to surgery, and 34 patients were sent to additional chemo. And in this group, after six months of chemo, 18 more patients were uh, deemed resectable and sent to surgery. So overall, 53% of the patients had a partial response or stable disease, uh, 35 of them were sent to theater, and of them, 28 were actually resected. Next, please. So if we break down the groups, uh, 91 patients only received best, support, best supportive care, 71 patients received only chemo, and 28 patients received chemo plus resective surgery. There are uh, um, the group that had resective surgery is uh, significantly uh, younger. Uh, there are no differences in gender. Uh, resective patients are more uh, head of pancreas tumors and were more likely to have a borderline tumors than locally advanced. 60% uh, of the patients had an R0 resection and 70% uh, had a node positive disease. 42% of the patients had morbidity after uh, the surgical resections, and unfortunately, two patients uh, died within 90 days after surgery for complications. If we see the uh, survival analysis, we can see that patients treated with chemo plus surgery or chemo had significantly better survival than the best supportive care group. Uh, overall survival in that group is 17 months, which is uh, very similar to the upfront resectable uh, patients. And in the particular group that received chemo plus surgery, it goes up to 35 uh, months. So in conclusion, we'd like to highlight that a third of the patients uh, with borderline arterial locally advanced pancreatic cancer can have a chance of creatine tank resection. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, just um, looking at your data, which is interesting. Um, first thing is, um, how do you, um, in terms of defining your classification, um, when you say borderline arterial, what does this group of patients uh, involve? So usually we, we break down the borderlines in the same way uh, they are classified by the uh, American classification. And the borderline venous are grouped with the resectables and they do not go to uh, uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy. They go to upfront resection. 
and all the patients that have a, a on imaging, uh, on MDT presentation, and to the eyes of the HPV radiologist and HPV surgeon in that MDT had any degree of arterial compromise, they are classified as borderline arterial or uh, locally advanced, depending on the degree of encasement. Okay, so we've got several questions, so they're clearly in a very contentious area here. Um, borderline yeah. arterial, uh, does that mean um, when you say, is that uh, the question is less or more than 180 degree involvement of artery? Less than 180 weeks. So more than uh, 180 are, are considered uh, locally advanced. So uh, for the borderline arterial, um, are you talking about hepatic artery, SMA? SMA or uh, um, hepatic artery, yeah, not completely. And, and in these patients where they eventually get resected, mm -hmm. um, are you saying that they get resected with the arter arterial uh, reconstructions? So um, the arterial reconstruction rate in our series is uh, 14%. There, there's one patient that had an SMA resection mm -hmm. and reconstruction. Uh, two patients had celiac resections uh, with reconstructions and two patients had uh, accessory hepatic resections. The rest of them had what we call a periodontal uh, dissection. That means that we dissect off the arteries from the tumors. Okay, so um, the, the, for us to manage this difficult disease, uh, often it's about who are the patients that you're gonna to select to do this sort of operation. Uh, can you tell me uh, in Birmingham, um, how do you decide who are the patients that you're going to resect and who are the, the patients. Obviously, from CT is not reliable in this context when they've had chemotherapy. Um, so how do you decide? So that's an excellent question. First of all, when, when we say active man management, one of the things we have changed in the latest years is that any patient that has locally advanced or borderline arterial are considered uh, as potentially surgical and they are sent for chemo with a neoadjuvant uh, intention. If after, and after three months, we reevaluate in MDT. Uh, we rely on imaging and basically we, uh, as you say, CT is not reliable to say if the patient will be resectable or not, but we can see if there is progression or not. And all the patients that do not progress are evaluated in, in the MDT by at least two or three HPV expert surgeons to see if they can have a trial of resection. That's the pathway we use. Okay. Um, so the next question from the floor is, how many patients have vein or arterial resection? I think you covered one aspect on the arterial resection. How many of them have vein resection? Yeah, and so the vein resection is uh, rate in this series is high, 80%. Uh, we have uh, uh, half of the patients have a uh, resection with end-to-end -end anastomosis and uh, the remaining have a uh, reconstruction with grafts. We usually, as we are a very busy transplant center, we use uh, cadaveric vein grafts for the, for the grafts. Okay, the next uh, question that comes in line with that is that uh, did any of this affect uh, the survival? Um, I think you, you, you showed survival curves of chemo plus surgery. Yeah. Um, for those patients with arterial sections, is the outcome any worse or better? Uh, I think, well, there, there are only uh, four patients with a, a arterial resection, so the number is very small to, to, to have uh, uh, any, any important conclusions. We have one long-term survivor more, more than two years after, after surgery, mm -hmm. uh, and we also have one, one of the casualties is from that group okay. after a, a graft to the reconstruction to the hepatic artery. So oh. I, I, I think uh, it's a, a bit of both. Okay, great. Interesting. Okay, I think, um, uh, Christian, over to you for the next speaker. Yes, Thank certainly. So we have Stephen O'Brien from uh, Louisville in Kentucky, who's going to talk to us about myopenia and myosteatosis in chronic pancreatitis patients. Over to you, Stephen. Thank you. Uh, moderators, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for the opportunity to present our work here today. <clears throat> My name is Stephen O'Brien, and 
I'm actually currently a core surgical trainee now in Cork, Ireland. This was part of some of the research that I uh, uh, did when I was in Louisville, Kentucky for the last couple of years. Next slide. Uh, chronic pancreatitis is a relatively common chronic condition and is associated with significant morbidity. Surgery is further associated with morbidity and mort mortality. Previous studies have demonstrated the adverse role of assessing preoperative muscle mass in patients undergoing surgery for pancreatic cancer. We hypothesize that preoperative myopenia or low muscle mass and myosteatosis or low muscle quality is associated with adverse postoperative outcomes. Prospective surgical database was created for patients who underwent pancreatic surgery or other abdominal surgery for chronic pancreatitis between 2011 and 2018. Preoperative CT scans within six months of the day of surgery were analyzed to measure myopenia and myosteatosis. Our outcome variables were major complications and length of stay. Next slide, please. This study included 75 patients with the majority be being female. Using the Tiger O classification, idiopathic or obstructive pancreatitis were the most common causes. And a significant number of these patients were found to be myopenic or myosteatotic. The most common operations performed were a pancreatic duodenectomy, a subtotal pancreatectomy, or puce dose procedures, which consisted of 63% of the patients. In terms of our outcomes, 21% of patients had a major complication as assessed by a Clavian Dindo score of greater than 3A. And a large number of patients were, re were readmitted, both at 30 days and at 90 days, with 44% of patients requiring or having a readmission within 90 days. After adjust, adjusting for comorbidity status as assessed by the Charleston Comorbidity Index, both myosteatosis and myopenia were significant risk factors for a major complication. And myosteatosis alone was associated with increased, increased length of stay. Next slide, please. We concluded that both myosteatosis and myopenia were common in this cohort of patients and they're both risk factors for adverse outcomes. The incorporation of this metric could help to stratify patients undergoing surgery for chronic pancreatitis. And furthermore, as the majority of these patients will have preoperative CT imaging, this could provide a valuable objective tool to help identify patients in need of nutritional and physical optimization prior to surgery. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Stephen. Really good uh, results and a very important and often neglected uh, patient group. Now that you've identified that um, uh, having low or poor quality muscle mass uh, has a negative uh, effect on uh, patient outcomes, what strategies can you think of that uh, you could implement to mitigate these? Well, I, I think what makes this particular group of patients more complex is their, you know, ability to essentially absorb absorb nutrients, and because they're in a kind of chronically catabolic state, they do represent a significant challenge. So, in in other in other you know major surgical resections, you know things like prehabilitation and you know prehabilitation units have been successful in you know changing patients' muscle mass and therefore their outcomes. So I think that would be something that could potentially be done as you know they do have a somewhat larger preoperative window to work with they could potentially undergo kind of more intensive nutritional therapy or fit or you know have more intensive work with physiotherapy prior to coming to surgery absolutely I think that's something that's um, because it's not cancer people don't think about prehabilitation uh, for patients with benign conditions such as uh, chronic pancreatitis Given you've, you've got great results in showing poorer outcomes, do you think this is something that you should use in the clinic uh, in terms of consenting your patients? So I think, I think it does represent, it in, in terms of, yes, it, it, should be, it could be incorporated into your, into your consent management. However, I think current, with current strategies of actually measuring myosteatosis and myopenia in patients, it does represent like a technical challenge. The current programs that are available, you know, some of them can cost us, you know, thousands of dollars or thousands of pounds every year for an institution to use. The software that I use and that I've used for previous for previous projects is an open source free software. So it just means, you know, training either, you know, your, you know, your registered nutritionist or, or some people on your on your multidisciplinary team to use. I think it, it is a feasible, you know, uh, 
uh, feasible tool for people to learn. I think you've just, we had a question from the floor, but I think you've just answered that. What is your approach to assessment of myosteatosis? So it's, it's something that needs a special program to learn so that you can uh, actually measure it. Yeah, so I mean, in, in our hospital, so currently in Cork, so we have, you know, we use impacts and that what, what I've typically done is you can get those scans kind of exported to uh, a, an institutional computer, put them on and, you, and analyze them using a free software. It does require a little bit of kind of, it, it does require a bit of learning how to use it, but it is something that can be on, you know, hospital computers. Is it quite time consuming? Um, at the start, it, what it is particularly, it is time consuming for, you know, an individual person to learn. However, after coming, you know, after going through a training period, you know, the scans can be analyzed in, you know, less than five minutes. Excellent. Very well done. Very interesting results. Uh, next one's down to you, Siong. Okay. So we're, not, we're entering the, um, the next set of presentations, which are the talking posters. So it'd be a short presentation followed by one question each. Uh, the first talk from this section will be uh, from Nadia um, from Manchester, who is going to tell us about um, pancreatic trauma. Hi, good evening, everyone. I hope I can be heard. Um, today evening, I'll be presenting uh, a short descriptive study on the management of contemporary, well, the contemporary management of pancreatic trauma in a tertiary HPV centre, which was my previous trust uh, at the Manchester Royal. Um, so as we all know, a pancreatic trauma accounts for about 0.2 to 1% of all trauma-related injuries worldwide. Uh, the American Association for the Study of, uh, or the Surgery of Trauma rather, um, grades pancreatic ductal involvement or uses pancreatic ductal involvement um, as a major determinant of the outcome and the injury severity. Surgical resection has been traditionally advocated for most major pancreatic ductal injury, which is AAST grade three and above. However, recent advances in radiological and endoscopic uh, procedures, such as radiologically guided drain, drains and uh, ERCP has improved conservative management options. Um, the method that we chose to employ was a retrospective study. Patients presenting with tra uh, pancreatic trauma from between the years of 2015 to 2019 to a major trauma center um, who were reviewed by the HPP services or admitted under their team were identified using hospital databases. Radiological results like CT imaging from the initial trauma and the clinical notes were used to record the severity of injury, the management modalities, complications, and the outcomes. The result of our study, which is displayed on the table on the right, um, shows that there were 20 patients within that cohort over four years. Uh, the median age range for those patients was uh, 22 and the range was between two to 65 years of age. Half of these patients were below 18 years of age and 80% of them sustained blunt trauma. Only four of them, 20%, sustained penetrating trauma, which is uh, gunshot injuries and knife injuries. 80% also had other associated injuries, such as uh, duodenal injuries, digestive tract injuries, uh, vascular and bony injuries as well. There were no grade five injuries, which is major disruption of the pancreatic head. Most of them were grade four and the rest were grade three and grade one. Of the 13 patients with grade eight, three and above, um, most of them underwent surgical intervention primarily for associated injuries, such as digestive tract injuries and extra abdominal injuries. The, of the four of them who did undergo surgery for pancreatic related injuries, there were three pancreatectomies and one pancreatic duodenectomy. Uh, overall, most of the patients were managed non-operatively and half of these patients had blood or blood product transfusions on admission. Complications were mostly due to infected collections in the immediate post-operative or rather late post-operative post period. Upper GI bleeds were um, developed in about three patients uh, requiring embolization and one patient sustained or developed hypocalcemia in the late post-operative post-traumatic period. Um, in conclusion, this is a limited study. Uh, it was a small series of patients, uh, although it was for a long, prolonged period of time. And uh, we, have demonstrated that selective conservative policy of managing pancreatic injury, including those with ductal injuries, is associated with acceptable outcomes. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Nadia. Uh, let me see if there are questions uh, from the floor. Um, so uh, let me ask you a question. To, um, so the small percent, uh, small fractions of patients when eventually end up with pancreatic resections, 
uh, did, did this group of patients um, uh, underwent surgery as a result of failed conservative management or was it upfront surgery? So um, initially, the, in the in initial post-traumatic period, most of the patients who underwent surgery were for associated injuries. However, there was only that small percentage which did undergo surgery for pancreatic-related injuries. Of those patients, there were very few of them because they did have uh, quite a large margin of resection. There, was, there were very few of them who went back into surgery for pancreatic-related um, uh, complications. Most of them were treated um, conservatively with embolization if they had a bleed or a uh, drainage of, of infected collections. The, that was all done uh, endoscopically. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, over to you, Christian. Chris, you're, you're on mute. Sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> so Catherine McGurk is going to talk to us about the effect of venous resection on pancreatic adenocarcinoma. Over to you, Catherine. Thank you very much. Um, so my name is Catherine McGurk. I'm a fourth year medical student at King's College London. Um, and in my study, we were looking at the benefit of venous resection um, on survival for patients. Um, with venous invasion. So resection is considered the gold standard um, curative treatment for pancreatic cancer, um, as it will eventually um, result in an R0 margin, hopefully, uh, if the surgery goes well. Um, but unfortunately, pancreatic cancer is often locally advanced um, at the time of diagnosis, meaning that a standard pancreatic resection isn't really enough. Um, and so for those patients who might have venous invasion, venous resection may be needed as well as a standard pancreatic resection. Um, when looking at the literature, it became quite clear that the, the survival impact of venous resection is a highly controversial topic. Um, and there's no real conclusive answer as to whether it provides uh, additional benefits um, when compared to the complications that it presents in terms of uh, operative outcomes. And so the aim of my review was to evaluate the survival benefit of patients and by comparing patient, uh, the overall survival of patients undergoing venous resection to patients undergoing standard resection. Um, so to do this, we, well, I performed a search of um, Medline, Embase, um, the Cochrane Trials database and clinicaltrials.gov, um, looking for studies over a 10-year period, um, so back from 2009, because this study was conducted in 2019. Um, and we were looking for comparative studies. Uh, unfortunately, there were no retrospective um, uh, randomized control trials, um, so all the data came from re retrospective cohort studies. Um, uh, at the end of study screening, 18 studies were found to be suitable for inclusion, um, and the primary outcome was overall survival, but in the studies that we collected, we also looked at um, the demographics, the operative outcomes, and post-operative data, um, to see whether we could understand why if why there would be a difference in survival um, so from our cohort of uh, 18 studies we had a, a total of 4728 patients um, with 1247 undergoing venous resection um, as you can see from the chart um, of the 14 studies that reported overall survival um, 12 reported a difference uh, in survival between venous resection and control cohorts, um, with the survival being poorer in the venous resection cohorts. Um, and of those studies, only three of them actually reported a statistically significant difference. But when looking at the actual raw data, you can see that there's a clear clinical difference in the survival outcomes. Um, hazard ratios were also estimated as a lot of studies did not actually report these in, um, in their results sections. Um, and from these, we could also see that uh, venous resection cohorts were more likely to have um, poorer survival. Um, when evaluating why this might be, we had to consider that overall survival is the resultant outcome of many factors. Um, so both patient and procedure characteristics, such as tumor histology and the post-operative course, adjuvant therapies. Um, and our study sh uh, showed that um, that in terms of tumor histology, um, there were trends towards uh, poorer tumor histology in the, um, 
venous resection cohorts, which might explain why. And in terms of operative data, there were significant increases in operative time, um, estimated blood loss and blood, blood transfusion requirement rates in the venous resection cohorts. Um, so overall, it's suggested that venous resection patients do have a poorer um, overall survival. But as to whether this is due to the procedure itself or due to other confounding factors, we are going to look at in future studies. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Catherine. Um, it is a very topical uh, subject and it's something that's uh, changed certainly since uh, I was training. Have you noticed a, during your, your searches, have you noticed a, a difference in trend between the uptake of venous resection over the 10 year period? So between 2019 mm. and 2009 where you started, do, have you noticed uh, any change in resection, uh, people using venous resection or not? Um, well, off the top of my head, I don't have the data, but from what I remember, there was an increase with um, obviously surgeons gaining more experience and being more comfortable performing the procedure um, and also changes in the definition of borderline resectability of pancreatic cancer to include um, venous invasion. So, but I don't have the actual numbers on the top of my head, sorry. Okay. And obviously the, the, those things that you've just mentioned now will also have an effect on uh, classification uh, of yeah. the tumour and then also to survival. So it's, it's also uh, one of the confounding factors that you have uh, there with such a wide range uh, yeah. in terms of um, uh, your, your study years. But very well done. Nice results. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Over to you, Siong. Okay. So um, our next speaker, uh, Shuki Ng, will be uh, giving us a talk on improving consent for lap coli. Um, over to you, Shuki. All right, thank you very much there. Hi everyone, I'm Shoki, I'm one of the clinical um, fellows in surgery in Hermione's Hospital. I'll be talking about our uh, we audit project con, uh, called Improving Consent for Laparoscopic Cholecystectomy. So with gallstone being quite highly prevalent in the UK population, laparoscopic cholecystectomy has become one of the top five most commonly pro um, performed procedures in the NHS. And with this also come with it issues with regards to um, how we manage complications following laparoscopic cholecystectomy, the most severe ones being biliary and vascular injuries. This is very pertinent due to um, a rising incidence of medical legal cases arising from post-op complications. In view of this, we aim to study how adequately our patients in the hospital were consented for both general and also procedure specific complications of laparoscopic coles. Also secondary, we aim to compare between let's say emergency elective patients, the different grade of consenting surgeons and also their subspecialty interest to see if these factors play a role in how um, comprehensively we consent our patients. As such, a retrospective study was performed over a three year period on patients who had lab coles in our hospital, patients with um, incapacity or whose, um, missing, whose consent forms were missing in our clinical portal system were excluded from the study. And then these were compared against general and procedure specific complications based on the NHS Choices website, which we used as the um, gold standard as it was easily accessible to both medical professionals and also the general public. Following this study, after exclusion criteria, we had 462 patients in this data set. And as we can see in the chart over there, the frequency of various general and procedure specific complications varied really greatly. Amongst general complications, bleeding and infection were the most common, whereas in procedure specific complications, nearly everyone mentioned bile duct injuries. However, everything else varied with um, great frequencies. Based on our um, secondary aims as well, we noticed as well that um, general complications like bleeding and visceral injury are more likely to be discussed in uh, patients undergoing emergency lab coles, whereas procedure specific complications like post cholecystectomy syndrome were more likely to be discussed in an elective kind of settings. We also noted that non-consultant grades being that of um, senior registrars, SC3 and above, or maybe junior, um, more junior um, surgical doctors like FY2 to CT2, for example, were more likely to discuss both general and procedure specific complications in the consent forms. Additionally, as well, we noted that colorectal surgeons were more likely to discuss general complications like visceral injury and thrombosis, DVT, 
versus their upper GI colleagues who seemed more likely to discuss um, procedure specific complications even in an emergency setting. In such, as such, we conclude that the, um, the quality of consent taken for LC is uh, hospital is um, varying, varies quite a lot and is thus suboptimal. This is because different patients are getting a slightly different version of you know, the various risks that would entail with a laparoscopic cholecystectomy procedure. We propose that a uh, more um, structured approach such as procedure-specific consent forms would be helpful in standardizing the consenting process for patients regardless of whether they are having it as an emergency elective procedure we also think that patient information leaflets given to patients at the earliest possible instance will also help in the consent process by um, educating them and promoting earlier discussion of the procedure. Thank you very much. Okay, thank, thank you, Shuki. Uh, it's, a, it's an important question, um, an important area for sure. Um, from uh, what you've mentioned, uh, obviously we all know that consent is a process. It's not quite yes. a, a single step. Um, um, in those patients for emergency, I suspect, um, obviously, there will be a single episode. How about the patients who are going through elective uh, operations? They would have seen probably several um, medical personnel during that period of time. Yes. Did this process and this data takes into consideration of that? Uh, no, we did not. We do recognize that. Uh, patients who are electively um, operated on would probably have the benefit of ha it having been discussed during perhaps their initial uh, admission, maybe later on in clinic, and then finally on the day itself before they get the general anesthetic for the procedure. However, we decided to just um, unify everything and just focus on the final consent form before their actual operation itself. So, so essentially, maybe the data is a bit in real life could have been better than this essentially. Perhaps so. Yeah. Um, so um, from what you said, in the new sort of, uh, in a virtual world, is there something that we could do to educate the patients or inform the patient before uh, going for a procedure, do you think? Yeah, perhaps so. So for example, um, from a technology point of view, we could perhaps um, direct patients towards the NHS Choices website, which actually does describe quite nicely in the kind of, you know, layman way, um, the various um, complications. Um, on top of that, that could also perhaps kickstart, you know, discussions with the medical team if patients have got any questions as such. But we also thought maybe a patient information leaflet, you know, might also help in terms of, you know, patients who might struggle with internet access and things like that, just so that they've got something actually in hard copy to read. Okay. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Shuki. Thank you. Over yes. to you, Christian. Thanks, Siong. Uh, so next, uh, uh, next uh, uh, presenter is uh, Mr. Ramadan, who's going to talk to us about the timing of rectal diclofenac uh, and the influence on post-ERCP pancreatitis. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm presenting this study on behalf of the upper GI surgery team, the ERCP team in Friendly Park Hospital, where I was working as an upper GI fellow last year. Uh, so it is about timing of diclofenac administration to prevent post ERCP pancreatitis. As we know, there is a growing evidence for the use of the rectal NSAIDs before or immediately after ERCP to prevent uh, post uh, ERCP pancreatitis. Although many studies have investigated that. A rule of NSAIDs in the prevention of uh, pancreatitis, the timing of administration is still controversial. Our standard practice in the unit was to give rectal diclofenac immediately post uh, ERCP, but we observed with the surge in the rate of the pancreatitis from January 2019 to September 2019, which was 4.7% when compared to the rate in the preceding two years, which was 3.2% in our unit. Therefore, we conducted this study to evaluate if the effect of changing our practice to pre-ERCP rather than post-ERCP diclofenac based on the result of two meta-analyses recently uh, published in 2017 and 18 about that. Uh, in order to do that, we divided our cohort of included patients into two groups. Group A or post-ERCP group, which is the standard practice, and the data were prospectively collected and retrospectively analyzed and included all patients 
came to the unit from uh, September 2016 to September 2019. Then the data after change our practice uh, uh, collected from October 2019 to December 2019 after uh, changing our practice to uh, the pre uh, eocd Declofenac. The total number of patients were 2,393 in both groups. Of these 1,289 were in group A, the post procedure Declofenac group, and 104 patients were in group B, the pre-procedure group. The overall pancreatitis incidence for our series was 3.7%. Uh, both groups were comparable in, in regards to age, gender, and indication, emergency, or elective. Uh, the gender didn't show any significant relation uh, in, to the entrance of pancreatitis when it started alone or, or with the age, combined with the age. And to study the age, we stratified uh, the studied group into three groups, uh, less than 40, 40 to 60, and more than 60. In our studies, there was no significant difference in the pancreatitis rate between all these three groups. All procedures were performed by three different consultants and we didn't find any significant difference in uh, depends on the operator. Uh, the rate of pancreatitis was 3.6% in both the ERCB declofenac group compared to 5.7% when we changed our practice. Although it is clinically significant, which put, put us off doing that, actually we stopped the, the, the study, but the difference didn't show any statistical significance. There was a statistically significant difference in the incidence of in comparison to elected procedures. In conclusion, our unit overall incidence is within accepted national and international standard. Pre-ERCB rectal diclofenac is not superior to post-ERCB diclofenac based on our results. However, we think that additional multi-center head-to-head high-quality RCTs are needed to compare actually the effect of time of administration and instance of post ELCP uh, pancreatitis. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mohammed. That's uh, interesting um, um, results and, and a big series. Can you tell me how many of your patients um, would have had uh, prophylactic pancreatic duct stents and whether that had an effect on uh, your uh, pancreatitis rate? Yes, yeah, excellent question because only NSAIDs and the pancreatic stent has proven significance in prevention of pancreatitis. But unfortunately, we haven't tried any in our unit, actually. It's not our standard. So we didn't do that in, in one of our patients, actually. Okay. And I, I also know that the, the, the papers you referred to regarding the NSAIDs, and they're used in dimethacin. Is there any reason why uh, diclofenac is chosen in your um, unit? Um, not in particular. I don't know if there's any reason or not, actually, but uh, this is what we do, actually. Yeah. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Over to you, Siong. Okay. Uh, our last uh, paper is from Huddersfield. Um, Arendt, um, you're going to give us a talk on follow-up of patients with symptomatic gallstones who are ineligible for entry into sunflower study. Good evening, everyone. Um, last but not least, thank you. <laughs> inviting us on to uh, to talk about this talking poster and for um, convening this webinar series over the last few months. We've been really appreciating. We've all learned a lot from it. I'm presenting on behalf of our two associate PIs that we've had for the last two years at Huddersfield Royal, um, Alex Dosis, last year's associate PI, and Sarah State, this year's associate PI. Um, we've been um, keen uh, presenters and part of the Sunflower Trial over the last a uh, couple of years, and um, as you know, it's aiming to compare expected management versus preoperative imaging of the common bile duct in patients with symptomatic gallstones. And broadly speaking, a patient is randomised into either laparoscopic cholecystectomy or preoperative MRCP. Um, the inclusion and exclusion criteria have been very well set and very well categorised, but um, amongst all various coffee rooms and theatre theatre suites over the last uh, year and a half since the trial started. There's a feeling that perhaps some patients um, who are the moderate risk common bile duct stone, those patients who maybe had higher liver function tests or a more dilated bile duct, they're actually the really interesting patients that we want to try and know what to do. Whereas the low risk common bile duct stone, broadly speaking, would have a fairly low risk of um, test abnormality anyway. 
So we felt it'd be interesting to look at uh, a group of patients who did not meet the inclusion criteria for the trial. So patients who were screened, who would have otherwise consented to, to be part of the trial, but did not meet the inclusion criteria. So we then thought it'd be interesting to look at those patients and follow them up and see what happens outside the trial. Uh, we took 100 consecutive patients who were screened and were excluded. And of those, the majority were those that fell into the criteria of a high risk of common bile duct stone. And indeed, the great proportion of those were those patients who had deranged liver function tests out of the inclusion criteria. And there were a small proportion, seven patients of the 100 who had a dilated common bile duct. And then the remaining 16 patients had a, a various number of reasons as to why they were not included, unable to have an MRCP, an empyema or a perforated gall by the, or severe pancreatitis. And a small group of patients had a change in the clinical plan. Overall, of the 100 patients who were excluded, so um, thought to have a higher risk of common bile duct stone, only 13 had a common bile duct stone um, subsequently diagnosed in the six months after their screening. Of the 77 patients who had deranged liver function tests, the majority had an MRCP. And that perhaps tells you about how these patients are managed on a standard DGH acute surgical tape. Very commonly, these patients will be having an MRCP. And broadly speaking, those patients admitted under a specialist upper GI surgeon, went on to have a laparoscopic cholecystectomy mm -hmm. and cholangiogram, of whom a small proportion had common bile duct stones. But those patients who admitted towards the end of a tape or under a non-specialist upper GI surgeon tend to have an MRCP. And again, a fairly small proportion of these went on to have a common bile duct stone. Common bile duct stones were associated with bilirubin ALT that were three times the reference range rather than twice the reference range um, currently set as um, the exclusion criteria for the trial. Of our patients who had a dilated common bile duct, all of them had an MRCP. And again, a small number of those had a common bile duct stone. So in summary, we found that um, when the exclusion criteria are followed for this trial, the actual proportion of patients who had a common bile duct stone is relatively low, but it's possible to think that these are the patients in whom the diagnostic uncertainty of the diagnosis of child is even greater. Those patients who have raised liver function tests outside the trial criteria, and therefore support the suggestion that inclusion criteria for the trial could perhaps have been expanded or could be expanded to help us answer the question for the moderate or higher risk common bile duct stone. Thank you very much. Thank you, Arint, uh, for that uh, presentation. Um, so in those groups of patients where, am I right in saying that the dilated common bile duct, patients where uh, any sort of imaging modality showing dilated common bile duct, they do have a pretty high risk of um, common duct ductal stone. Yeah. If you look, if yeah. you look at their seven patients, um, kind of 40, 50% of them had common ductal stone. That's right. And interestingly, so a dilated common bile duct beyond eight millimeters or a liver function test that were over three times the reference range, both were associated with a higher risk of common bile duct stone. Um, and so duct dilatation in itself or in and of itself is perhaps one of those um, criteria where you would think about a higher risk of common bile duct stone. But the um, liver function tests, which are the biggest reason for excluding exclusion from the trial, were perhaps a, a less good predictor of a common bile duct stone. But you're absolutely right, dilated bile duct beyond eight millimeters was well, a pretty good marker for a, a, a subsequent common bile duct stone. So I guess the group that uh, you think could be expanded for the trial would be the ones where they range LFTs, but not, not so bad. So. Yes, that's right. Um, you'd certainly think that uh, expanding the LFT criteria might make the, might make the the question that we as surgeons want to answer that bit more useful and relevant as well. I think the trial itself is, is excellent, particularly for us allowing to answer these questions um, within a trial setting. But it just makes you wonder that like, were the criteria to be expanded, some of the harder patients, the harder decisions would be answered by the study as well. Okay, good. So how are you going to take this forward? Are you going to speak to Giles? Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, I don't... Um, I, I don't think that um, this is something that's only being discussed in, in our unit. And I think the trial investigators are, are very responsive and, and open. Um, certainly, I know there's been lots of talk about um, expanding inclusion criteria in the past, but more than anything else, it's something 
again, you know, these trials and these studies do evolve and change. Um, and we'd be happy to present this at the uh, next National Sunflower Investigation Meeting. Thank you, Erin. Um, we were just joking among ourselves earlier that we should give you a certificate for the frequent flyer. <laughs> yeah, anyway, it does feel like that. <laughs> we, we appreciate the contribution. Um, I think uh, with this, uh, we will conclude uh, the session tonight. Um, uh, for all the participants, thank you for participating. And we would like to draw your attention to some of the e-posters that your colleagues have put effort into um, putting them together. So please um, go on to the website and look at the abstracts and some of them are quite interesting. Thank you, everyone. Good night, Thanks a lot. Good night everybody. Thanks to all the panelists. Bye.